Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host beside me, Anthony Rivardo. If you're new to the Fireside Giants channel, make sure to like and subscribe below on the YouTube channel. Um, so much draft content, more stuff coming out. Of course, free agency, not as exciting as last year, but nonetheless, we're taking the right steps forward and getting putting together some solid progress. I'm really excited to see where the Giants team goes next year. Currently for 2023, we have like $87 million in cap space, plus the additional $9 million we save from Logan Ryan's contract. Um, it seems to me that Logan Ryan may have kind of asked the Giants to release him because literally less than 24 hours later, he signed with the Tampa Bay Bucks and uh, Tom Brady, his old friend, kind of reuniting there. So maybe there was something going on. Who knows? Um, but the Giants don't save any money, barely anything, pretty much uh, an extra roster spot and veteran, uh, just a minimum deal worth of money. And, you know, now we're kind of looking at the future and saying, where do we go from here? We don't have much cap space. We don't really have a lot to work with. The draft is where we got to build. The foundation must be laid, but we do want to give some grades on the moves made up to this point. The specific ones will be Ricky Seals, Jones, Tyrod Taylor, John Feliciano, Mark Lewinsky, Robert Foster. If you haven't heard his name, wide receiver, formerly of the bills, cutting Logan Ryan, restructuring uh, Sterling Shepard and restructuring Blake Martinez. Those are the categories that we are going to grade today. Before we do so, Anthony, how are you doing today, my friend? Doing great, man. And I, I think, you know, you're kind of theorizing here what happened with Logan Ryan. I think you might be on to something because it was almost instantaneous. It seems like he was ready to move on. The Giants were like, okay, we'll grant your wishes. I mean, we have no confirmation on that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if we get the full story one day and it ends up being that Logan Ryan just asked for a release and the Giants granted his wishes because that's kind of what it seems like. But yeah, the Giants haven't done anything too exciting, anything crazy so far this offseason, but I feel like they've done the right things. It's been a low-key offseason, but I think the Giants are a better team team for the moves that Joe Shane has made. So I'm excited to dive into the moves that he's made thus far, grade them and kind of discuss how we think he's done and how we think he's going to do going forward. Yeah. I mean, look, what Joe Shane has done up to this point has been pretty solid, but it's also been not that exciting. And unfortunately guys, we're going to have to suffer through an actual rebuild. Now, this isn't going to be the Dave Gettleman era where we spend a hundred million dollars um, trying to piece together a team when the when the, when he can't draft and the drafts before that were awful in Jerry Reese's era to finalize things. Um, this is a reset, guys. You look at most of these positions; they're raw. You know, offensive line. We have Andrew Thomas. That's it. Glowinski and Feliciano are they good players? Sure, in, in their own respects, but they're not great players. Tight end completely rebooted the tight end position. Pass rushers. All we have is Aziz Ojolari and Quincy Roche. Linebackers, Blake Martinez coming off a torn ACL. We'll talk about his restructuring, obviously. Um, wide receivers, you know, you got Kadarius Tony, Sterling Shepard coming off his Achilles tear, and then Kenny Galladay. Um, you know, a lot of these spots are going to have to be completely rebooted. James Bradbury eventually, I believe, will be traded. So, quarterback, also a question mark. Safety, you got Xavier McKinney. Um, and, you know, looking at Wink Martindale's defense, this is going to be a mostly cover one man coverage style defense. But I wouldn't be surprised if he incorporated a strong safety. And that's where a lot of people have mentioned the name Kyle Hamilton out of Notre Dame. And the dude is a unicorn back there, can play strong safety, free safety. Guy's huge. I've seen people compare him to Isaiah Simmons. He's not even in the same realm as Isaiah Simmons in terms of quality. Like, he's head and shoulders better than Isaiah Simmons as a free safety. Isaiah Simmons moved up into this kind of money backer, like, strong safety role. But Hamilton is, is a purebred, like, free safety, but he can play multiple alignments and positions. Um, his sideline to sideline speed is incredible. We saw that on the film. Um, his tackling is tremendous, and he can man cover people. That's a, and he can also go off, uh, rush off the edges. A big frame, he's like 6'5". five. So you don't find guys like that very often that can play free safety. Um, his pro comparison, according to uh, Lance Zerline, is Cam Chancellor. And if you could get anywhere close to that type of level, you're looking at one of the best draft picks of the year, like hands down. Um, so that's kind of something to consider. Uh, well, you know, maybe we'll talk about that in the future, but I do want to jump it right into the first guy. Ricky seals. Jones, Ricky seals. Jones is an interesting player. Um, grading him. I think I would probably give this grade a B minus. He's not a good run blocker. He's a decent pass blocker, but you're not going to really use him in that way. He's a good receiver. He has three drop passes in the middle of the field from zero to 10 yards, which is where Evan Ingram's danger zone was. We needed a guy that could actually catch the football there. Ricky Seals Jones can pretty much do that um, at, at least an average level. Where Evan Ingram was well below average. He cannot handle the fastballs from Daniel Jones. Ricky Seals Jones is going to be your experienced NFL veteran. Is he going to start? I'm not sure. Maybe we go get, get uh, Trey McBride out of Colorado State. Maybe we go get Jeremy Rucker out of Ohio State. There's a ton of different guys I'm really intrigued by. 
Um, and I think that they will pair Ricky Seals Jones with a rookie in the third round. That's where I think the Giants will take that pick. Um, and being that that is the case, I think it's a fine sign. I think B minus is fine. Um, you know, in context with the amount of money we have to spend, B minus, I think is a, is a fine grade for Ricky Seals Jones. What do you think? I think that's a fine grade as well. I mean, I could kind of see this being just a C plus, you know, it's super average. He's a very average player and he's going to play a very average role. Now he's kind of a journeyman. He spent his first two years with the Arizona Cardinals, then was with Cleveland for a year, then with Kansas City for a year, which is where he met Mike Kafka. Then he was with Washington, where he scored a game one and touchdown against the Giants this past season. And now he's on the Giants. And, you know, he's not some dominant player. He's, he's maybe like a fringe starter at the tight end position. I think Ideally, you want Ricky Seals Jones to be your tight end too. You definitely don't want him to be your primary tight end. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like the Giants, you know, they're not in position to sign another tight end in the free agency. They're probably going to have to pivot towards the draft, as you mentioned. So hopefully they're able to find a really solid talent in the draft that can kind of be a tight end alongside Ricky Seals Jones and hopefully take over as a number one by the end of the season. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what the Giants do, whether or not they choose to start the rookies or choose to start the veterans, right? Because that's kind of comes down to a new coaching philosophy from Brian Dable. What's he going to prefer? You know, say the Giants get a third round rookie tight end. Is he going to start over Ricky Seals Jones, even if he's not as good? Or is he going to sit behind Ricky Seals Jones, even if he's better than Ricky Seals Jones? That's all going to come down to a coaching philosophy. So Ricky Seals Jones, as you mentioned, not a great run blocker, but he's a decent receiver. He gets the job done in the short to intermediate area. And that's really all that the Giants need out of that tight end position now that they're running the spread offense under Brian Dable. Exactly. So, you know, you're looking at him as really purely as a receiver, not a run blocker. Um, and, you know, Anthony did a really good video a while back, you know, kind of detailing that Brian Dable and Mike Kafka may be passing the ball 70, 65 percent plus. Um, and if that is the case, you're going to need a lot of good pass catchers and Ricky Seals Jones can get that done. He has had some injury history. Um, but I'm not too worried about it. Now, the next player on the, on the docket is Tyrod Taylor. Of course, the Giants did not go after Mitchell Trubisky. Tyrod Taylor's contract is essentially a two-year, $11 million deal. It's not that crazy. It's really actually pretty tremendous to acquire him for that price tag. He can win games for you. Tyrod Taylor is a great backup quarterback. Compared to Mike Glennon, you're looking at David versus Goliath. You know, it's like Tyrod Taylor is a tremendous um, talent. But the question is, can he stay healthy? Now, being a backup, I think, is his preferred role because unless he punctures another lung, I think he's going to be just fine. <laughs> the Giants, the Giants, uh, you know, medical team has had their fair share of hiccups. But I will say, I think Tyrod Taylor, if he remains healthy, will be a fine backup. He can replace Daniel Jones. He has a similar skill set in terms of the mobility he acquires. Um, and he can throw the ball. You know, he can win games for you. He did so with Houston last year a couple times. So I think this is a good signing. I will give this a B plus. Um, the money was not crazy at all, in my opinion overpaying a little bit for a good backup quarterback considering Deion Jones' uh, injury history is a good is a good idea. And it's a two-year deal, basically. So if Deion Jones and they move on from him after this season, Tyrod Taylor can be a bridge quarterback if they want him to be. They could be a, He could be a backup and a, and a mentor, by the way. He was a mentor for uh, Justin Herbert. He could be a mentor for a rookie quarterback. That is super valuable, guys. Keep that in mind. So Tyrod Taylor, I'm giving a B-plus in this scenario. Yeah, I give this an A minus because I really love the insurance that it gives the Giants going into next season. So I think it's great to give Daniel Jones a competition. I like that aspect of it. And I like the insurance and having a proven veteran who has a similar playing style as Daniel Jones as the backup quarterback. I think that's great. Tyrod Taylor fits that bill perfectly. That's like the number one priority for the Giants. They wanted a backup that wasn't like Daniel Jones to Mike Glennon, right? Because Mike Glennon doesn't play anything like Daniel Jones. They wanted Daniel Jones to Tyrod Taylor because Tyrod Taylor is also a very good rusher and he has similar qualities in terms of being a passer that Daniel Jones possesses. So I think that was great. That's the great aspect of it. But then you look at the other aspect of it where this is a two year deal and it's five and a half million dollars per year. So you're not only getting him for this year as a backup, you're getting him for next year as a backup and potentially as the starter, maybe as a bridge for a rookie quarterback if Daniel Jones doesn't pan out this season. And honestly, we look at the state of this roster. The Giants have said they've done everything possible to screw up Daniel Jones. They've never given him the pieces in place. He doesn't necessarily have the pieces in place right now. I mean, yeah, the Giants look like they're going to be a little bit of a better team just based on the, the depth moves and the stability moves that they made. But I'm not expecting Daniel Jones to have that breakout. So it seems very likely that next year Tyrod Taylor is going to enter that season as the starter, as a bridge quarterback for an upcoming rookie that they're going to have to look to find in the 2023 NFL draft. So that's why I'm going to give this an A- minus because, yes, I love what it does for this season, but I love way more the insurance and flexibility that it gives the Giants going into next year. 
Yeah, and I think that's a super uh, solid logic to follow. Um, the next player on the list is John Feliciano. Now, John Feliciano, guys, this is a weird one, right? One year, $3.25 million. That's a pretty decent contract for a guy who's never played center in his life. Um, is it crazy money? No, it's not that crazy. I mean, $3.25 million in context of the amount that we have to spend, it's crazy. But in reality, it's not that crazy. Um, Feliciano has value because he can play both guard spots. That's where his value really comes into play. Um, the center situation, he said he's been waiting to play center. He's played behind. He's been waiting behind guys that are making $11 million a year. They signed him to a pretty cost-efficient contract. Um, he's a good player. He's a, he kind of serves as a depth guy. He's had some starting opportunities. Um, but I, for the most part, I think that the money is fine in terms of what he offers. I think that he's been waiting for the chance to play center. Clearly he wants to, and he's really familiar with the, with the, with the coaching staff, right? He is familiar with Bobby Johnson, our offensive line coach back when he was with Vegas. He's, he's uh, familiar with Brian Dable. And I think the coaching is everything guys. Look, you can look at individual players and say, they offer us this, they offer us that. But the reality is. Tyrod Taylor had his best seasons when he was with Buffalo, right? That was the, his, his last year with Buffalo was the first year that Joe Shane was there in 2017. Um, Feliciano learned from Bobby Johnson, learned from Brian Dable. I think the coaching is everything guys. The coaching is everything. So when you have a guy like Feliciano who doesn't have a lot of snaps at center, but he's, he wants to play there and he's, he's excited about the opportunity and he has good coaching to go with it. I think he'll succeed. You know, like what, what we have lacked over the past Four years is terrible coaching. That that has been our biggest liability. Our biggest downfall has been bad coaching. And you'd be surprised what good coaching can do. The fact that Andrew Thomas has become as good as he has become uh, with with bad coaching is is unbelievable. And, and that's why I know with good coaching, he's going to become an all pro. You know what I mean? Like this, we're looking at a player who's going to become elite. And that's, I personally feel that way because, and this is predicated on the fact that the coaching improves. And I think it will. Uh, but Feliciano, I, I, I give this, I'm going to say I'm going to give this a B for the context of the money and the context of everything and the fact that he has never played center before. I think it's a B because I trust that he's going to get good coaching and he knows what to do and he's and he's been working there in practice and he understands what uh, being a center entails. Um, but also the value he brings at both guard spots. That cannot go unnoticed. So I think a B is good for Feliciano. Yeah, I think I'm also going to give this about a C plus again, just because I think he's an average player um, and it's what the Giants needed for sure. So I guess in terms of needs meeting expectations, they definitely knocked it out of the park in that regard because they just needed at least someone average to play one of these positions, whether he's going to start at right guard, left guard or center. They needed someone average to start there and they've got that now. So I like it, but it is just an average player. It's not some, you know, swing out of the park, you know, home run hit. It's a very good signing at that position. Um, it's low money. That's an expensive position as well. Anything on the interior offensive line has been really inflating in contracts recently. Um, I like John Feliciano. I think it's a little bit questionable why they've already penciled him as the starter uh, at center because he has more experience playing the guard positions. But I have a little bit of a theory. This could be them potentially saying that as a little bit of a smoke screen. Maybe they have a long-term idea here at center. Maybe they're thinking about trading down, going for a Linderbaum. Who knows? I, I'm speculating, of course. But I think that it's interesting that they decided to declare which position he was playing. And it's not it's March. You know, it's not like we're in July or August training camp preseason. We're not at that point. So I think it's interesting that they've declared they signed him to play center rather than signing him to play interior offensive line. And ultimately, I think that he's probably going to move around on that offensive line. He'll get reps at guard. He'll get reps at center. And that's pretty much what they should do with him. I think that he's just one of those players who's going to be average for the Giants, which is what they need because all of their offensive linemen have been below average. So they get an average offensive lineman that has positional flexibility. I do think it's a really good sign in for them, but you know, it's nothing out of the park. So I'm just going to go ahead and give it a C plus. Okay, that's fair. I, I think I can I can also agree with that. Um, now let's head over to Mark Lewinsky, former uh, Indianapolis Colts offensive lineman. Another guy who really finished last year super strong. The last seven games of the 2021 season, dude didn't give up a single uh, hit or sack. Um, he was a tremendous pass blocker, great run blocker. You know, looking at the Indianapolis Colts and what they accomplished with Jonathan Taylor back there, the dude scored more touchdowns than the Giants did as a team. So when you're considering that fact, you know that he's been coached up well, especially on the offensive line. Mark Lewinsky, of course, got a three-year deal. I think about $24 million with $11 million guaranteed, maybe a, little, a couple hundred K more than that. But um, when you're looking at Lewinsky, I think this is a good signing. I think it's a, I'm going to give this one a B as well, because in context with the amount of money that we have to spend, we didn't really have a great, uh, you know, opportunity to go after some of the bigger names. Now, 
another guy who who actually landed a similar contract was James McDan it was James Daniels, um, formerly of the Chicago Bears. Now there's a difference, right? Daniels played well, and I think he's what is he 24 years old, super young. That maybe that was a guy you wanted to roll with. Glowinski's heading toward 30. Um, so there's a big difference in terms of age gap. But by the time Glowinski, it's really a two-year deal. You can move on with minimal dead cap after the second season. I think that they wanted somebody who was coming from a great team, and he played well on a on a sorry, not maybe not a great team. I don't want to go as far as say the Colts are a great team, but they had a great offensive line, um, especially before the injuries hit. Glowinski played well on that great offensive line. Now, when you look at the Bears, they had one of the worst offensive lines in football. So when you're looking at the comparison, Glowinski knows what a great offensive line looks like, and he played a significant part in helping improve that. That's a logic I could I, I'm presenting to you to consider. However, the age difference is significant. James McDaniel or James Daniels, obviously, you sign him and you're like, okay, we can develop this guy. He's young, athletic, has experience. Uh, maybe I would have gone that route, and maybe that would have been the better idea, but. I mean, I, I have to say, I, uh, Joe Shane, um, Brian Dable, they obviously had their reasons to go with uh, Glowinski, and I, and I want to trust them in this process until they prove us that they were wrong. Um, but you know, Anthony, what are you thinking? I think I'll give this. I think I'll give this a B minus. Yeah, I'm also going to give it a B minus because I do think he's a slightly better player than John Feliciano. Uh, so I give the grade a little bit higher, but. I would give it a higher grade because I think Mark Lewinsky is actually a good player and he is a good right guard. Like this is, I think he's above average, you know, in my opinion, because you, you saw that, like you mentioned there, Alex, the uh, final seven games of the season, he went on a real tear there and he looked like a great pass protecting guard. Right. So I think he's actually like a good player. I think John Feliciano is probably just going to be about average. And I think that Mark Lewinsky should be about above average for the giants and actually have a solid impact. But when you take a look at the contract and you compare it to the likes of James Daniels, that's where the grade drops for me down to the B minus rather than being an A minus or something like that, because just bang for your buck, the value that the Steelers got for James Daniels and the value that the Giants got for Mark Lewinsky. It's not the same. I think James Daniels, you know, they paid up a little bit more to get him, but I think that he's the better player and the younger player. So he's still got room to develop. Mark Lewinsky, I think the main reason that the Giants would have preferred him is a, yes, he was cheaper, but also B, he's a veteran. So he has a presence. You know, there's no he's probably got an idea of what it's like to, to transition to a new playbook or transition to a new pass blocking scheme. James Daniels might not have that because he's just been on one team before and now he's transitioning to a new team. So there's more growing pains involved with that. But Mark Lewinsky being a veteran, you know, 30 years old, been in the league for you know, a long time. He's got more of an understanding of how to make that transition. He's just more established in this league. So I think that's probably why the Giants went ahead with him. All of their signings so far have been veterans, um, pretty much for the most part. They're going for the veteran takes. They just want to get these older guys who have the experience and stability. You already know what they are. There's no boom or bust involved. They just are what they are. And I think that's what they wanted in Mark Lewinsky. They just know that they're getting a good right guard. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's totally fair, right? Um, now here's the thing. Here's a question that I would ask you guys in the comment section. Do you think that they should have invested in a left guard? Because personally, you could make the argument, and this is something that I've thought about, that you want to pair Andrew Thomas with a good left guard, right? You want him to be his best version of himself. You don't want him to have to overcompensate like he did last year with Matt Skur and Ben Bredesen, right? You don't want that. But you can also make the argument that the right side needs ample support. So spending at right guard makes more sense because you know Andrew Thomas is going to play well no matter who's at left guard. Um, now, I kind of at this point, I'm, I'm com coming to the conclusion that they're going to draft a left guard, right? They're going to draft a guard. And they also have Shane Lemieux. And, you know, plugging in Shane Lemieux. And uh, I, I really just, I, I want Shane Lemieux to be the guy. But can we really depend on Shane Lemieux, guys? It, 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 what what has he proven to you? You know, think about it like realistically, like a lot of people are like, Daniel Jones hasn't proven us anything. He hasn't shown us that he can play at a high level consistently. What has Shane Lemieux shown us? He's shown us what he was the worst. Okay. Let me, let me say this as plain as possible. He was a bottom five pass blocking guard as a rookie. And then he tore his patellar tendon. What on earth makes people think that he's capable of being a good guard in the NFL? You know, maybe he can be. And I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but until he proves that, there is no way in hell I'm I'm a, I'm handing over a starting left guard spot to Shane Lemieux. They got to draft somebody and let him compete because I'm done handing offensive line jobs away like it's freaking candy on Halloween. You know, I'm done with that. 
It's not, it's not a sustainable practice. You've got to draft a left guard, whether it's uh, Devin Kennard, whether it's, um, whether it's Zion Johnson out of Boston College. There's a plethora of options for the Giants to look at in the draft. Um, maybe Ikema Kwonu even plays guard. I, I mean, I, I hopefully he plays right tackle, but you know, who knows what the Giants are going to go with that left guard spot, but it cannot be only Shane Lemieux and it, they cannot be handing him that job as if it's his to lose. That is un. that is, that would just blow my mind. And if they, and if they do do that, if they do do that, do do, that's a funny word. If they do do that, <laughs> I, <laughs> the Alex jokes are back, Anthony. God damn. <laughs> but if they do do that, it's basically predicated on the fact they are seriously committing to a rebuild and they're like, screw it. We just got to get through this season. I don't think they're going to do that, but if they do, it's because of that reason. Um, but now moving on to the next guy, Robert Foster, nothing really to, to, to write home about. He's just a, he's kind of a depth receiver, a guy that could probably fill a special teams role. Of course, the giants let go of Keon cross and who ended up signing like a $10 million deal with another team, which is kind of crazy, but Robert Foster receiver, Back end guy, you know, maybe come in and fill in for some injuries if if that uh, happens. And of course, the Giants are always loaded with injuries, so we should expect that. Um, but Robert Foster, I mean, I don't know really what he's worth. I don't know what he's going to contribute, but I mean, I'll give it a B signings. I think that's kind of an average level. Anthony, what do you think? Yeah, average in my mind is more like a C. So I'll probably just give that. You know, it's a very cheap contract. It's a very you know low end player for a low end deal. This is exactly what the Giants need to do: just pick up some of these low end guys that have familiarity with the coaching staff and just put them on the roster and let them compete, let them you know contribute in some way. So Robert Foster, I mean, he's nothing special. Like he's nothing crazy. Uh, he's got returning abilities, so it, you know you could see him be the, being the punt returner or kick returner this season, and he might provide a little bit of extra value there. But mainly. He's just a speedy receiver that has some ability with yards after catch and maybe as a deep threat. So it's nothing too crazy to write home about, but I like the signing. I'd give it a C or a C plus. Yeah, I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe average isn't a B. I think like that might be a little bit overzealous. So maybe you're right. C is probably average. Um, but let's let's go over to the next. These these aren't players specifically, but rather decisions that management made. The next one on the on the docket is cutting Logan Ryan. What is the decision? What is the grade for cutting Logan Ryan? Honestly, after finding out that we didn't save any money from his contract, really, at 775 k I think I got to give Cutting Logan Ryan maybe, like, a C. But, like, we don't know if he he asked for a cut. You know, I mean, he could have asked for, to be cut. But I feel like having him would be better than not having him. You know, the giant – I mean, look, there is – honestly, like, I'm, the more I think about it, the more I think, like, there's no way that the Giants realistically looked at Logan Ryan and was like, we're better off paying him eleven million dollars to not be on the team than him being. Then you know what I mean. Like that doesn't make any logical sense. At the very least, he could serve as a depth piece in case of injury. He doesn't even have to freaking start. So like I have to imagine Logan Ryan was probably like, if you're not going to use me properly, I'd rather just be released and, and go to a team where I can contribute. And clearly, he signed with the Bucks less than twenty four hours in. So that would probably that kind of suggests that he. Uh, that 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 makes sense, but um, who knows? It hasn't been reported, but it kind of logically it makes sense. I th I think cutting Logan Ryan is a C, just based on the fact that we don't have enough information to really make a proper evaluation. But um, I, I can't really go any higher than that because we didn't get anything in return. We lost a player, and we're paying eleven million dollars to freaking Sam Donald's ghost out here. So you know that's kind of how I feel. What do you think? Yeah, I mean. I'll probably give this move a D just because it doesn't clear any space. Um, like, I understand he's no longer a, a scheme fit. They don't have a need for him on the roster. But I felt like there was a better way to handle this where the Giants maybe could have, I don't know, moved him to a new position. I thought maybe he could have played slot cornerback, but added depth there. Maybe tried oh. to figure out a way to contribute at free safety. Yeah, I mean, he's he's getting up there in age. I guess it's probably best for the Giants to just move on. I don't know. This is kind of one of those things where we don't know the full story. We don't know the exact reasons why they decided to move on. So it's kind of hard to grade this one, in my opinion. I mean, I'll probably give it like a D or a D plus just because, again, they only saved like 800K in cap space. I wish that the Giants, uh, you know, the last regime had, you know, structured that contract in a way that made it a little bit more cap friendly so that they could have released him down the line and gotten more money for him. But from what I understand, it cleared up cap space for next offseason, so that's also a good thing. Maybe it's not as bad as I'm letting it on to be, but I, I don't know. I like Logan Ryan. I think that he's a solid veteran contributor. Again, the Giants have signed a lot of veteran contributors. I would have liked to see him stick around, be that leader, uh, continue to captivate that locker room, and you know, be a captain on the defense. So a little confused why they decided to cut him without you know 
trying to figure it out in some way. So, yeah, I'm probably just going to stick with like a D plus on this one. It's not my favorite move, but, you know, it's nothing damning. It's not like the Giants are just going to lose every game this year because they cut Logan Ryan, right? I mean, and honestly, if he did want to leave, if he asked to be released, then, yeah, I'll just give it like a B plus because they did they did a good player and a good man right by him. So good on them for that, if that is the case. But if not, I don't know. It's just a little bit confusing why they would make this move without really freeing up any cap space for this offseason. Yeah, I agree. I think I think that's probably what ended up happening. Um, and they save a lot of money in the process for next season by doing so. Um, I think a lot of that dead money gets pushed ahead, so they don't they don't really don't have to pay him anything next year, which is a benefit. Um, but yeah, Logan Ryan, like I respect the hell out of him. He's a good guy, really good human being off the field too. He does a lot of really great work for animals and and stuff like that. So I respect the hell out of him. Um, and you know, I think he's gonna go win a championship with Brady again. The dude just can't retire. Eli Manning even beats the Tom Brady at freaking retirement. It's unbelievable. But the next thing, the next guy, next next situation on the docket: restructuring Sterling Shepard. That is a freaking A plus, absolute A plus. Joe Shame, what this guy, what this dude did to restructure Shep and Blake Martinez, and we'll just combo Anthony, we'll just combo pack those guys because it really is the same thing. They saved about six million dollars on both on both players, right? I think they actually ended up saving more on Sterling Shepard than they would have got by cutting him. I think they only would have saved four point five million on Sterling Shepard. Um, and they ended up saving six million on Sterling Shepard because of the injury. So he didn't really have a lot of leverage. They kept the player. Um, he's a leader on offense, and then Blake Martinez, obviously a leader on defense, who you know suffered that injury. Um, actually, we were at the game against the Falcons. That sucked, um, but you know he did say we did save a little bit of money there. So I think this A plus combo package for Shep and Martinez. Joe Shane knocked it out of the park with those uh, restructures and lowered their cap hit for the future while actually keeping the player and lowering the cap hit this season as well. So I think uh, you know at face value, it's a really tremendous deal for the Giants. They they're they're keeping two essential maybe not essential, but two leaders on both sides of the football. And I'd say Blake Martinez, keeping him around is going to be a massive benefit because we have Tay Crowder, who is probably average at best. I want his best day. He's average. Um, um, I, you know, I think we got a lot of value out of Tay Crowder because he was the, he was Mr. Irrelevant at the end of the day, but you know, he's not a great player by any means. His ceiling is capped for sure. But I think that Blake Martinez having him and maybe grabbing a linebacker in the third round, we have two third round picks, uh, maybe grabbing one there. Yeah, could be a really good benefit for the Giants and really letting a young guy develop and you know, maybe someone physical. So, Anthony, when you're looking at restructuring Shep and Martinez, do you also agree it's probably in the A range? Absolutely. Yeah, I think these were perfect moves for the Giants. These are talented, good players. The Giants don't have many talented, good players on their roster. It's probably a good idea to keep at least a few of them around. Um, I think these are definitely the better. This is definitely the better alternative than cutting these players, right, to just clear up cap space. What they did was they were able to clear up cap space and keep the talent on their roster. So, yeah, that's a perfect A-plus move in my eyes, especially because, you know, Shepard, when he's healthy, is great. Blake Martinez, when he's healthy, and he usually is, is phenomenal as a linebacker in the NFL. So I really like both of these players. I want to see them bounce back from their injuries and be better than before, especially on these bargain deals that the Giants now have them on. And look, maybe they come back and they don't play well and they don't look like they're the answers again. They're gone next season. You know, like it's that simple. They don't have any long-term contract tied to them now this was a perfect move by joe shane this is exactly what he needed to do clear up some cap space while also keeping some talent on the roster and that's exactly what he did with both of these moves so i love both of these moves again hoping to see sterling shepherd bounce back from that achilles injury have a really good year with daniel jones hoping to see blake martinez bounce back and thrive and wink martindale's defensive scheme this is what i want to see and now we have the ability to see that and thankfully we don't have to watch the giants overpay either of these players because neither of these players no matter what they do the season is overpaid because they're now on very cheap and affordable contracts and i think that's perfect so again i think this is a perfect move by joe shane i think he did an amazing job here kept the talent on the roster while clearing up the cap space i love it and i'll give these moves an a plus yeah absolutely so i think those are kind of wrap up most of the significant deals and moves the giants have made this off season um and i, I gotta be honest with you guys this next year is going to be tough it's going to be tough to to get through because we know the giants are rebuilding but hey i'll tell you what how fast did that Dave Gettleman tenure go? It didn't go fast. It was slow as hell because we sucked and he freaking destroyed our team. He's still trying to destroy our team because he put us on bad cap situation. I'll tell you what, though. If we can do this right, if Joe Shane and Brian Dable can do this thing the right way, get rid of the bad contracts, you know, build through the draft. We have two first-round picks. Who knows what they're going to do? If we landed Ikemikwonu and, and Kayvon Thibodeau, man, 
Oh my God, I can't, I, I would be out of this world. I'd be over the moon. You know, there's a lot left to, to see what's going to happen. There's a lot left uh, to be desired for this Giants team. I think that what, what we've done so far is nothing crazy. And I think that's what really inspires me the most is that the Giants have been overly crazy in trying to solve holes that were just never sustainable to do to begin with. What we're doing now is low key. We're kind of in stealth mode, going below the radar, doing what we got to do, shedding the salary space, getting rid of players that you know aren't going to contribute to the scheme and schematics. That is what is necessary for the beginning of a rebuild. We did not do that in the beginning. And I personally, and I know Anthony as well, we learned a lot about what not to do for <laughs> over the last four years of Dave Gettleman's tenure, you know? And like, we've been excited about moves. We've been like, oh, wow, like he did a good thing there, did a good thing here. At the end of the day, he was awful. He was God awful. And we learned a lot. You know, we were when we, what, I mean, when, when he started, when he took over for the Giants, I was 20 years old, 21. And Anthony, what were you like 17, 16? You know what I mean? Like we were, we were really young. So we had a lot left to learn. And I'll tell you what, because of that process and that we learned from all that, it'll only, it really is only going to help us provide more and more, uh, you know, efficient and better content to you because we now know what bad looks like and you do as well. So we hope to continue providing that uh, great content as always, my friends. And if you want to see more of that, make sure to like and subscribe below on the Fireside Giants YouTube channel. And of course, leave us a great review on uh, Spotify and Apple. Really appreciate all the love as always. And make sure to drop your um, your grades below for these categories on the YouTube channel as it's going. I really would love to hear uh, what you guys think about them as well. But we'll catch you guys in the next episode and have a phenomenal weekend. Thank you.